Hey everybody and welcome to another episode of How I Built It, continuing our series on how to build your business. Today I get to talk to Nicole Kohler about content strategy. This is something that I struggle with and usually just publish what I think I should when I think I should. Nicole provides us with some great advice from her time at Automatic working with both the Jetpack and the WooCommerce teams. We'll get into that in a minute, but first, a word from our sponsors. This season of How I Built It is brought to you by two fantastic sponsors. The first is Liquid Web. If you're running a membership site, an online course, or even a real estate site on WordPress, you've likely already discovered many hosts that have optimized their platforms for a logged out experience, where they cache everything. Sites on their hardware are great for your sales and landing pages, but struggle when your users start logging in. At that point, your site is as slow as if you were on $3 hosting. Liquid Web built their managed WordPress platform optimized for sites that want speed and performance, regardless of whether a customer is logged in or logged out. Trust me on this, I've tried it out and it's fast, seriously fast. Now, with their single site plan, Liquid Web is a no-brainer for anyone whose site is actually part of their business and not just a site promoting their business. Check out the rest of the features on their platform by visiting them at buildpodcast.net slash liquidweb. That's buildpodcast.net slash liquidweb. It's also brought to you by Jilt. Jilt is the easiest way to recover abandoned shopping carts on WooCommerce, Easy Digital Downloads, and Shopify. Your e-commerce clients could be leaving literally thousands of dollars on the table, and here's why. 70% of all shopping carts are abandoned prior to checkout. Yes, you heard that right. 70% of shoppers never make it to checkout. And that's why you need to introduce your clients to Jilt. Jilt uses proven recovery tactics to rescue that lost revenue. It's an easy win that lets you boost your client's revenue by as much as 15%, and it only takes 15 minutes of your time to set up. Jilt fully integrates with WooCommerce, EDD, and Shopify, and you can completely customize the recovery emails that Jilt sends to match your client's branding using its powerful drag and drop editor, or by digging into the HTML and CSS. Even better, Jilt's fair pricing means your clients pay only for the customers they actually engage, and you get to earn a cut of that through Jilt's partner program. Whether you have clients that process one sale per month or 10,000 sales per month, be the hero and help them supercharge their revenue with Jilt. Check them out at buildpodcast.net slash Jilt. That's buildpodcast.net slash J-I-L-T. And now, on with the show. Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of How I Built It, the podcast that asked, how did you build that? Continuing with a a little theme that we have for uh, building different business strategies. Today, I am talking to Nicole Kohler, who is a growth marketer at Automatic, about building a content strategy. I'm very excited about this. Nicole, how are you today? I'm great. How are you? I am fantastic. So I've got to say that I've always, uh, perhaps this is putting the cart before the horse, I've always taken a field of dreams approach to marketing, whereas I build something and I assume that people will come because it is good. But I've learned over the last year or so that that's not the right approach. Uh, And I think that uh, your experience doing content marketing for Automatic uh, could probably help both me and the listeners improve their marketing strategy. So first, why don't you tell us a little bit about uh, who you are and what you do? Yeah, sure. So I've been with Automatic for about two and a half years now. I actually joined with the WooCommerce team. I joined six weeks before the Automatic acquisition, so I had really good timing. I joined to work on content strategy, specifically as a writer initially. So I was working on all of our blog posts. And then over time, I started working on uh, more of our strategy. I started working on our email strategy, general marketing, copywriting, et cetera, et cetera. Six months ago, I actually changed teams. So I am now working on Jetpack. And as a growth marketer, 
I am responsible for our content strategy, our overall brand messaging, like how we communicate about our features, our new features, what we're releasing, and then sort of like the copywriting within the plugin itself, um, the copywriting on our website, et cetera, et cetera. So content is a big part of what I do. It's a big, I would say, obsession of mine. (laughs) If you see me speaking at a WordCamp, it's probably related to content in some capacity, either like how to do better content content with Jetpack or content for your WordPress site, something like that. So that's a bit about me professionally. Personally, I love dogs. I'm obsessed with Pokemon and uh, I'm on Twitter a lot. <laughs> nice. nice. Very nice. Who's your favorite Pokemon? Raichu. Raichu. Very nice. I have a Raichu tattoo. So folks who see me in person, like don't hesitate to ask. <laughs> <laughs> that is fantastic. One of the original 150. I don't know. I think I may be I feel like I'm a little bit older than you, but I know that I was there for the original 15, 150 and I was like, newfangled Pokemon, whatever. <laughs> so, uh, but that's, that's awesome. So something that you said there was that you focus on the email marketing and, and blog posts, but you also focus on copy on the website and within the plugin. Can we just like touch on that real quick? Cause that's really important, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's something I didn't really do a lot of with Woo. And now that I'm in, in Jetpack, it's, I'm learning like how important those little touch points are and like how much of an impact just like one little line of copy can make, like a little nudge to upgrade your plan. If we word that, I don't want to say incorrectly, but if we word it a certain way versus a different way, it can have a huge impact on conversions, on whether or not people trust us. And getting to work on that is really exciting. Yeah, that's awesome. And I always feel like, I mean, you know, I'm a mostly a developer by trader. At least I build things, you know, whether it's my online courses or a plugin or something like that. And copy is always an afterthought for me. I'm pretty keen on the error messages. That's been like a crusade of mine to give users good error messages, but like the, the nudges for upgrades or even like the way that you word directions or like what a feature does can, like you said, have a really big impact on conversion. Cause if you're not communicating that, if you're not speaking your user's language, then there's going to be a disconnect. Oh yeah. And it's something that I'm trying to get more involved with. Like every time that we are about to have a release or about to add a new feature to Jetpack, I'm trying to get in there and take a look at the copy. And as you said, make sure that we are communicating something clearly. So like if there is an error, are we telling people what to do next? Or are we telling them what's causing the error? Like vague error messages are horrible. <laughs> so like what caused this error? It's not your fault. You know, it's, it's you know, maybe it's like a, a temporary thing thing on the host side or maybe it's something wrong with the plugin and you need to contact about it contact us excuse me about it so yeah clarity is definitely something i'm trying to work on <laughs> yeah absolutely now so you know again i'm just going to talk about my experience which is i don't really know what's the best way for me to figure out like if my copy is connecting right i can try different things i could say okay i had a bunch of sales after I made this update, but was it because of the update or was it because I was running a discount or, or what's the best way for me to, to kind of figure out and, and make sure I'm getting the right connections to the, the visitors to my website? I mean, there's a couple of different things you can do. The first piece of advice I would give you is only test one thing at once. So if you are running a sale, like you just said, don't go into that sale expecting to like pull concrete results about the success of your copy out of the sale because people are more likely to be drawn to your site from the major discount or the buy one, get one free plan, whatever it is that you're doing, than your copy. So if you want to test new content or new copy, try to test that on its own. As far as testing goes, there are a lot of tools out there that will let you like A-B test two versions of a page against another, build dedicated landing pages. Like you can do that in WordPress or you can do that with, with different tools. You can get like heat map tools out there to see how far people are going down pages, whether it's like an A version of a page versus a B version or just like your site in general. And then you can just try different versions of social messages. So if you have a tool like Buffer or you're using Jetpack's publicize feature, send out multiple tweets or multiple Facebook messages to the same piece of content and just use the built-in social analytical tools, I guess I'm trying to say, to see which of those messages 
got the most people clicking. So there's a lot of different ways that you can test depending on what it is you're trying to test, whether it's a social message, your homepage, blah, blah, blah. But definitely I would emphasize like only test one thing at once because if you're trying to test a homepage and social messages and a sale and, you know, copywriting and your plugin at the same time, you're you're just not going to get uh, clear results from that. Right, right. Gotcha. Yeah. Throw a bunch of darts at the board at the same time and you don't know which is going to hit the best or whatever. That's exactly. I, yeah. So cool. So you mentioned that uh, you had, uh, I don't know if you said this on the pre-call now or the actual interview, but, <laughs> uh, in case you didn't mention it in the episode, you mentioned that you had uh, moved over to the Jetpack team and you have more experience now kind of building that strategy Maybe not from scratch, but but you definitely have more more of a hands on approach to that. Uh, so, yeah. and and Jetpack is a well established plugin. So, what kind of research did you do to, to to set out and like map out your content strategy? Yeah. So, a little bit of background. Like when I joined WooCommerce, I joined at the same time as Aviva Pinchas, who worked originally like as our sort of brand strategist, marketing strategist. And she had a big, a really, really big hand in creating the WooCommerce content strategy. When I switched to Jetpack, we didn't have any content strategy. There was nothing. <laughs> so it's just like, we put up blog posts when we have a release and we think we have something to say. So it was just like, oh boy. So some of the research that I was doing wasn't necessarily research, but more of like the experience I had working on WooCommerce and what I learned from Aviva and what she had done. So that played a really big part in it. Knowing what another automatic product had done to be successful. So like talking about your own features, kind of like owning the message about yourself. I took that over. But then I did a little bit more research on like, you know, what are these other security plugins? If you want to call Jetpack a security plugin, which it kind of is what are these other security plugins talking about? What topics are they talking about? What's important? So kind of like researching their content. Uh, what kind of content are they producing? Are they doing long form? Are they doing short form? What social channels are they on? Where are they successful? And kind of since it is a WordPress product, like doing a little bit more research in the WordPress environment, I think is the word I'm looking for. So like, what is the general sentiment right now about Jetpack on like WP Tavern on other sites and digging into the comments, which is not my favorite thing, but making myself do that. <laughs> and like, what are people saying right now? What are their gripes? What are they, what information are they not getting that we could be providing? And in some cases, like I was finding things that we were not talking about that kind of bled over into docs, like things we were missing in docs. So Around the same time that I started, we had a uh, guild form of happy, mostly happiness engineers to work on Jetpack Docs. So it was kind of like a happy, or a happy coincidence that nice. we also have this happening at the same time. It's not like just me working on all this written stuff, but it was a lot of like research in the kind of like internet sphere that Jetpack is. So is in so like security products and WordPress products and, and seeing what people are saying about us right now. Gotcha. So so it's it's interesting that you mentioned, you know, that you feel that Jetpack, well, you say that Jetpack is a security plugin. It certainly offers that. It offers like the security aspect, the backups aspect. Uh, it, off it also offers a, a whole lot of stuff. Did you find or do you find difficulty crafting a clear message because of that, right? I don't... I, I hope that's not like a, I'm not like trying to nail you to the wall with this question. I'm just very curious about this. Yeah. Oh, no. I mean, that was, that was like my, my big fear coming in is that I would find it very difficult to yeah. like come up with a concise statement summarizing the importance of Jetpack. So the first few events I went to, I was trying a couple different things. The most common question we get at WordCamp specifically is what even is Jetpack? Because mm. I've heard of it. And I have no idea what it does. Yeah. So we've kind of summarized it as Jetpack is a WordPress toolkit that lets you design, grow, and secure your site. And that seems to be working really well. People are just like, oh, okay, so how does it do that? And then we can go on and talk about the features that do all that or the features that they're most interested in. So if someone says, okay, well, I already have a security suite I like. How does it help me design my site? Or, oh, I don't have any security tools right now. I guess I just got started. Like, tell me more. And then we can talk about backups. We can talk about brute force protection. So that has been working pretty well. I think that tagline is somewhere on the site now. So yeah, you didn't 
uh, catch me off guard with that at all. It's it's uh, <laughs> something I've been working on, actually. <laughs> nice. That's awesome. And I mean, that makes a, a ton of sense. And I, I love that. It is very concise. And then, like we said earlier, you're speaking the user's language because now they could say, oh, OK, how do I do that? Right. Where, yeah. Whereas just saying, like, we've got the publicized module. Like, OK, what does that what no. does that mean? To you? <laughs> like, what's a module? Right. Like, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so. we're trying to avoid using those those words like i've heard people at camps go like oh it takes the features from wordpress.com and puts them in a plugin and it's like if if someone is new to wordpress and they've never used wordpress.com they're going to be like okay what are those features right like what like you said what is a module i've in the past like even i've been at camps and been like oh jetpack has a bunch of cool features and they make your site awesome and it's the worst description (laughs) ever and i think that's that's what we're trying to get away from like especially in our content is like just talking about Jetpack as a bunch of features. It's so much more than that. And it can be custom tailored to your site and to your business and your specific needs. So that's what we're trying to to get across. Absolutely. That's that's awesome. And then the other follow up question I kinda had was about the dot com dot org site, right? Because you have Jetpack, you connect it to dot com. D- do you find that that's it's a very first of all, I should say it's a very easy process, right? Jetpack makes oh, it very, <laughs> very easy to do all that. Do you find that that has to be part of your messaging, or is that just? Uh, I guess what I'm trying to say is, is do you find enough confusion around that that it should be part of your messaging, or is it just like, well, to make it work, you do this one, two, three, and you're done? So we've gone back and forth on this. <sighs> There's there's like two sides to this, right? We don't want to slip this phrase about you need a WordPress.com account in there because people are going to be like, wait, what? Why do I need this? And that right. brings up this whole new conversation. At the same time, we don't want to be dishonest about the need for a separate account because then if someone is setting it up and they assume it's one click and you're done, they might be thrown off. And too many logins is definitely a problem mm-hmm. that that we're all faced with. So the way that I'm trying to talk about it now, and again, it's something else that I'm, I'm sort of testing out is if it comes up, I've had someone just directly ask me uh, recently at a local meetup group, why do I need a .com account? Some of our features use the .com servers for hosting to speed things up. And you just need to connect to .com to utilize those features. If you don't connect, you can't utilize those features. And that seems to help. Like being upfront about why you need that second account, showing them the connection flow if they're very curious Mm -hmm. that it is one click, and then having more detailed documentation about here's how the process works, here's how you can disconnect, here's how you can troubleshoot the connection, which is something, again, that our Quill Guild has been super, super great about. Like They're fantastic people um, working on these docs. So it's it's been a little tricky. And like I said, I've kind of gone back and forth about being too honest or not not talking about it a lot, but I think we're figuring it out. (laughs) Nice, nice. This episode is brought to you by Vast Conference. Vast offers instant conference calls that have crystal clear audio quality and tons of great features. Never get dropped from a conference call again. Join conference calls from anywhere in the world and they have the best customer service. You can use their conference call service from anywhere with an internet connection or phone line. Visit buildpodcast.net slash vast to start holding conference calls that you can actually hear. And now, back to the show. That's fantastic. And it sounds like it really comes down to, I mean, you're out, right? You're boots on the ground here. You're talking to users. You're kind of, uh, well, so you're talking to users, right? I mean, that's maybe some of the best research that you could do to see what their pain points are. So yeah. Cool. Very cool. So we're about halfway, a little more than halfway, and I haven't asked the title question yet. So if I want to build a content strategy myself, or let's talk about Jetpack, how do you build it, right? Uh, We talked a little bit about research and talking to users, but what does that look like? Like, do I blog first or how do I, where do I even start? Uh, (laughs) I think something I was actually thinking about yesterday, coming into the this this recording one of the biggest misconceptions that people have about content marketing is that you have to talk about topics like other than yourself so you have to start with like this sort of top of funnely content that you just sort of link to your brand right so mm-hmm. for jetpack that might look like 
here's why security is important for your site, or here's why you should have professional WordPress themes, or like, here's why WordPress is the best platform. And then just at the very end, have like one call to action for Jetpack. I think that the assumption is that you can't directly talk about your brand to have successful content. And I've seen that for so many companies that start content marketing, like they avoid talking about themselves until the very end of their content. And they have like this little call to action saying like, oh, by the way, we do this. And that may get them a lot of interest from search engines. Like that top of funnel content might be super popular, but it doesn't put someone in the right mindset Mm -hmm. to convert at the end in most cases. So something I learned from WooCommerce and that I've carried over to Jetpack is to sort of, I think I said this phrase earlier, to sort of own the conversation about your brand. So content marketing for us has always looked like we are going to talk about Jetpack and we're going to be the experts on Jetpack because we are the experts on Jetpack. So we're going to talk about, here's how you successfully use our product. Here's why you should use our product. And here's some tips for making it easier or taking your site to the next level. And then like maybe have some content that gets people in from search engines, that top of funnel type stuff. So like, yeah, here's why WordPress security is important, but then also give them related reading that is further down the funnel. Like, by the way, yeah, we do have this thing and here's how you can find out some more about it rather than just trying to sell them when they're not ready for that. Gotcha. Which you can do with Jetpack. (laughs) <laughs> oh yeah, absolutely. <laughs> but like I said, I think that's it's a huge misconception that like you can't a that you can't talk directly about yourself and like sell yourself in your content and b that you have to start with like this unrelated to content. Like I think if people are first of all, people are coming to your site to like learn about you and read about you and if you're not serving the people that are already on your site, that's a big miss. Secondly, I think if you are only producing content that's going to get people from search engines and then not giving them anything else to read and just putting calls to action to buy at the end of that. Like it's like a super short funnel that just ends in the brick wall or something. (laughs) So like, yeah, yeah, I, I was thinking about that yesterday and I wanted to bring that up. Like, I just think it's really important to, to think about how you own your own messaging. Yeah. Man, that's that's such a great like that's gonna be my big takeaway now, right? Because I mean, my blog is mostly like <laughs> tutorial stuff, and yeah, I can get away with that a little bit because I'm like teaching people, and that's what my product is, right? Is my online courses, but you know, people, I'm not telling people why you should learn from me, you know, like so yeah. they're not getting that, or like uh, what you said made me think of this anecdote. This actually happened to my wife and me. We were meeting up with a friend of my wife's. She had worked the night shift, but like because of of scheduling, she just decided we would meet him like after work. So we go to we go to grab like brunch at this place and he walks in with a notepad and and he he framed the conversation as, "Hey, I would love to catch up with you guys. You know, you were just recently married. I'd love to catch up." And he walks in with a notepad. He said his friend might be joining us. And uh he sits down and I said, is this a sales conversation? Are you going to try to like sell us on what financial planning? That's what you do. He goes, Oh, well, uh, it doesn't have to be like that. I'm like, we're not interested. And like that made the whole rest of the, the brunch like awkward because, oh. and he's like, let me just text my buddy and tell him not to come. I was like, why would you f- like uh, the old bait and switch <laughs> after my wife just worked 12 hours? Like, come on, man. So like that, I mean, it's an extreme example, right, of, of what you said, but it's it's true. I wasn't in a position where I wanted to be sold to. It was a Sunday morning. I just wanted to have brunch, you know? <laughs> and yeah. He, and he's like ready to come at me with like financial planning, which we didn't even need. So <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. No, it's, it's super true, though. Like if you're in a position, like if you're reading something online about like how to make a great brunch and you get to the end and it's just like buy, buy a skillet, you're like, it's not... <laughs> That's not why I came here. No, it's I, like, I have a you know, I want to make yeah. a good omelet or whatever. <laughs> but if you end that piece of content with like, by the way, did you know that you can make like really great brunches in a skillet? You know, read some more about that. Yeah. That kind of leads you further down. And that's kind of what I'm talking about. Like not ending your content in a brick wall. <laughs> right, right. Absol- I've never used that phrase before, but I'm going to use that from now on. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. And it's, and it's absolutely true, right? And, you know, on the same token, you walk into a car dealership knowing you're going to be sold to, right? So you're, oh, yeah. you're mentally prepared for that. Awesome. So you mentioned that you do a lot of testing, right? So 
I like to ask, like, has the product gone through any transformations? Like, that's like the canned scripty question that <laughs> I ask. But in this case, I want to ask, like, were there things that you that you started off with in your content strategy? Which I guess, actually, let me back up. C- can we do, is there like a possible way to do like a, a list, like one through five? These are the things that we're doing for our content strategy. Or is that like too, uh, too like uh, boxed in? Oh, no, I don't think it's too boxed in. Hmm. So you mean like, like, just like, if I want to start today, like, do I like come up with topics and then blog first? Or do I oh, like yeah. an email list? Right? Like, like, what's what's that look like? Yeah. Hmm. <laughs> so like, oh, that's a good question. So like, number one, start writing. You can't get any results. You can't get iterate on anything. You can't test until you actually have content to test against you until you have content to like pull email subscribers in against like you actually have to start producing something. And kind of along those same lines, like, I taught a writing class the last two years at the Automatic Grand Meetup, which is our meetup where every, since we're all distributed, everyone meets up in person. And the very first lesson that I taught in that class was kind of like, accept your mediocrity. (laughs) (laughs) Not that you might be a mediocre writer, but like, if you're new to content strategy or new to content marketing, or if your business is brand new, like, accept that your first few posts might suck. Mm -hmm. You know, you're not going to get any any comments or like people might hate them like but you have to do something right you have to put something out there so like yeah number one start writing number two i do think like building an email list of some kind is really important because you can get those people coming back to your content you can send them content in the future you can send them maybe sales pitches or something but start doing it even if you're not actively using it like passively start building that email list jetpack has a subscriber option that you can let people just sign up on this on like a sidebar or widgetized area you can use that if you're not ready to pay for pay for mailchimp or use mailpoet or like another service number three start researching like start looking at your competitors, start looking at other people in your sphere, whether that's like other plugins, whether that's other WordPress companies, whether it's other businesses, whatever it may be, see what kinds of content they're doing, look at their comments, look at their shares, look at their social media profiles. Obviously don't copy them, but see what's resonating with their audience because you're probably going to have very similar results. Take note of what kinds of content they're doing, if they're doing like customer stories, if they're doing, if they're highlighting feedback, if they're highlighting their successes, like how well are those types of things going over? If they're highlighting their successes and they're not going over a lot, over very well, maybe don't talk about yourself, Mm -hmm. you know, as much. (laughs) Maybe talk about your customers more. Yeah, Kind of depends on the industry. Four, start testing content. Like, And this can be really vague, right? So this might be just like publishing a bunch of stuff and like looking at Google Analytics and, you know, seeing, well, this type of post got more time on page versus this type of post. This type of post got 28 comments and this, this type of post got zero comments. Like maybe testing is not the right word, but like actively start watching Mm -hmm. and picking out the successes versus the failures or the sort of in-between stuff. And then I would say... Number five, I I wouldn't actually do this fifth, like somewhere in the middle. Try to set up like a content calendar. Try to hold yourself to a standard of publishing, even if it's only once every two weeks, once a month. Get your topics planned out in advance. Know what you're going to publish when. Know who's going to be working on it. Know who's going to be responsible for every single bit of the stuff. Maybe this isn't the first thing that you would do or the third thing or even the fifth thing, but do it at some point. So you can be responsible so that someone can be responsible and that you are definitely publishing a flow of content and that something is nagging you, right? right so right. like if you miss a deadline, if I miss something on co-schedule, I get an email, right? I get something that's just like, hey, you didn't do this. Even if it's just like I'm a day late on, right. on getting something to our editorial team, right? Like it helps. It does. Yep. <laughs> so yeah, those are my five things. <laughs> awesome. I love that. Uh, and I'm going to link in the show notes to the interview that we did with Nate Ellering from CoSchedule to learn about CoSchedule because it's a very yes. nice content scheduling tool. And uh, I mean, another thing about content scheduling is that if you know, if you are building things like, uh, you know, it allows you to kind of create the story you want to create, right? You're not saying, oh, did I write? Did I write about this already? Should I write it? Should do I need a follow up? Like thing, you know, you can kind of put that in the schedule, see what you've done, see what you then need to do. So I, I love that. Yeah. 
so now back to the transformations part, right? Is there <laughs> anything that you set out? Maybe you like scheduled a piece of content that you realized, oh, well, this isn't really working for looking at our analytics like this. This is no longer what I want to do. You know, how do you kind of change change things up in the middle of your content strategy? Yeah, just talking about like something that we had at Woo. So we did a lot of these customer stories where we would spend, I mean, these were the most time intensive posts that we did, right? So we would spend several hours interviewing someone who was using WooCommerce. Some of them I think we did on site. Some of them we did like on Skype. Some of them we did like on Zoom or Google Hangouts or something with multiple people versus one person. Mm -hmm. So we would interview people, find out how they were using WooCommerce, learn about their business, learn about their aspirations, and then write up these really, really long involved posts anywhere between like 2,000 and 5,000 words. I mean, really huge, yeah. meaty pieces of content. And they did not seem to be resonating with our readers, even though we felt like they should be the most successful pieces on our blog. Mm -hmm. And this is about like a year and a half ago. I remember posting something internally like, look, our customer stories, they're not failing, but they're not doing what we think they should be doing. And why is that? Like, what's going on? So that was definitely one of those like, you know, stop, you know, evaluate everything things and figure out like, what can we do to make these pieces of content successful? Or what can we test to make these pieces of content successful? Because we felt like they were so important, right? Like showing other people how they could use WooCommerce, highlighting people's successes with our product. And Ultimately, we just came up with like a list of five things we wanted to test over the next few posts. So like making them shorter, having, I think it was like having less storytelling, having more quotes from the business owners, focusing more on WooCommerce and less on the business, focusing more on the business and less on WooCommerce. Like, and I think that's kind of the, the key is like, if you find something that's not performing the way you think it should, don't give up right away. Just look at it and kind of think of like, what could I what could I change in the next version of this that might make it more successful? But then also look at like, how are you handling distribution? Are you actually promoting that content a lot? Are you putting paid promotion behind it? Could you put paid promotion behind it? Like try to evaluate all the potential touch points, right? Like email, social, paid ads, blah, blah, blah. Like Evaluate everything. Be very critical. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. And and again, that makes a lot of sense, right? Because the follow up question that I thought uh, while you were, were saying this was, you know, am I am I going to have immediate success with, you know, let's say I publish like this blog post that I think is going to be amazing. I actually did very recently uh, called like what HIPAA means to web designers. And I was like, mm -hmm. this is going to get like a million shares. Uh, and it didn't. Does that mean that I did something wrong? Does it mean it never will? Like what's the evergreen content? Is that a, like, that's a thing that I've heard about? You know, what does that mean in the scheme of content marketing? Am I playing the long game here or are, are, uh, are there ways to play the, the short game? Content marketing is absolutely a long game. Like, I, man, like, one of my annoyances is that, like, I, I worked in an SEO agency for a little while. And one of the, the big things that the team I worked on did was try to create content that would go viral. And, like, we were successful several times. But that, that like viral piece of content was viral for a week, right? And then after that, no one cared about us anymore. <laughs> so like, yes, you absolutely can create viral content and like your content marketing can be super, super popular for a short amount of time, but it doesn't do anything for you. Right. Like we didn't even get clients from it that mm -hmm. I, I'm aware of. Like, I don't want to bash what they were doing at all because they were, we were super, super good at it, but like, yeah what did they even do for you? So yeah, it's absolutely a long game. Like it didn't just because your piece didn't garner a lot of popularity right away. doesn't mean you did anything wrong, especially because content takes a long time to generate attention on search engines, which is really where a lot of content marketing is going to get people from something might get shared on Facebook on someone's wall, like, you know, immediately and no one will see it, but then someone will get to it you know, an influencer will get to it three months later when they actually find it on Google and then they'll share it on Facebook. And that's when it has its, you know, gotcha. big amount of success. So I think you're, 
you definitely have to like realize that you're playing a long game. Evergreen content also is definitely a thing. If you're writing about a, a topic that isn't like happening in this specific moment, if right. you're right, like like security for WordPress, for example, like something that we write about, yeah. is always going to be a thing. Right. So right. any content we create about that is going to be evergreen. So I hope that answered your question. <laughs> yeah, I mean, absolutely. And I mean, you know, going back to this HIPAA article, I mean. People aren't going to be interested in HIPAA until they come across it, right? Like, not all web yeah. designers need to know what HIPAA is. Sure. But if somebody gets, like, a medical client and they're like, oh, by the way, you have to be HIPAA compliant, they're going to be like, what's what's HIPAA compliant mean, right? So, yeah, you know, it's like you said, it's definitely a long game. So we are coming up on time, and I haven't asked you my favorite question yet, but I, I do want to ask one more. Uh, it's it's a, around plans for the future, because you say it's a long game. Is it like a forever game? Am I just going to be like content marketing this thing for the rest of my life? Like, when am I done? How do I know if I'm done? Things like that. So I don't necessarily think it's a forever. I can talk. I promise. So I don't necessarily think it's a forever game. There are some people and some brands who will find that content marketing just like genuinely does not work for them. And it could be because of their audience. It could be because of, of the products they're selling. You know, there are a bunch of different reasons. And they may work on it for a little while and just like get no comments, get no interaction, get no shares, get no leads from that content, but then find that they're publishing videos, like how-to videos, and getting a ton of engagement and a ton of sales leads off that. They may find that their social messages are getting them a ton of engagement and a ton of like responses. They may find that direct mail or something is getting them a ton of leads. Yeah. And they may be like, okay, so... I'm getting tons and tons of success elsewhere. These channels are highly successful. Content just isn't going to do it for me. And I think that's, A, that speaks to the importance of multi-channel marketing and like trying multiple things. But B, it also says that just for some people, content marketing, because of your audience or because of your products, may not necessarily work. And it's okay in that situation to you're not giving up, right? Mm -hmm. Like you're folding a non-successful, non-viable method of reaching customers. Right. And you also can reapproach it later, right? Like there are plenty of industries where customers were not looking online for products five years ago, but they might be doing that now. So maybe now is the time to revisit content marketing or revisit social media. So no, it doesn't necessarily have to be a long game, but it is something that you probably potentially should try. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And I mean, that uh, just to drive home the point of you're not giving up, right? I mean, you don't want to keep if I started a pager business in t 2005, and like, was like, <laughs> it's gonna work one of these days, like, I mean, that I'd just be wasting time and money, you know, I'd be like, uh, you know, what's his name? Duffy from uh, 30 Rock. That was the, the inspiration <laughs> of that. So uh, awesome. I love that. And so uh, we'll end with, uh, do you have any trade secrets for us? Oh, I don't know if I have any like trade secrets. I think a lot of what I, I know and talk about is like public knowledge, mm -hmm. but I, <laughs> I like, I like the phrase, uh, don't read the comments, <laughs> but I, I like to take that one further, which is don't read the comments if you haven't eaten lately <laughs> because you'll respond really badly. Like one of, one of my major responsibilities at Woo and not not so much a jetpack because we have a team that handles comments is like was to respond to comments especially like on our release posts and we would get like hundreds of comments on these posts and some of them were not great <laughs> like they were people you know trying to stir things up you know imagine wp tavern just like toned down a little bit right, so that was right. like the release post comments my advice for dealing with comments and you could probably take this as a trade secret is to always put yourself in that person's shoes and imagine like the worst possible day that person could be having and why they would be motivated to make a comment like that. No matter how nasty it is, no matter how frustrated they may seem or no matter how like illogical it may seem, because we'd get people commenting and being like, I can't log into my site. It's like, this has nothing to do with the content of this post, but like imagine what drove them to that level of desperation to right. make that comment on that post. So like, rather than being snippy and being like, go contact support. Like I right. try to put myself in that person's shoes and then like leave a helpful response. Awesome. So yeah, again, it's maybe not necessarily a trade secret, but I'd also make, I'll always make sure that I like 
wasn't replying to comments on an empty stomach <laughs> because then I wouldn't be that helpful. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. My brothers say I get hangry. They say I get frustrated, mm. right? So I'm not like mm. I'm not like mean and mad. I'm just like Ugh, everything's annoying, right? When I'm hungry. Mm. So and and I love that. And if you still need to if you feel the need to write out a snarky response, open up Notepad or whatever and just type oh, it out. Oh, God. Man, yes. I do that with tweets. I must have drafts of like a bunch of like stupid responses <laughs> in Tweetbot because I'm like, I type it out and I'm like, is it worth it? No, it's not worth it. <laughs> there is, there's only one time that I posted a snarky response to a WooCommerce comment and I will own up to it. I posted it on Twitter. Someone asked why, asked why we didn't warn them that we had a major update. And I, I kid you not, the plugin update thing had a bar in red above it, the notification that said, WooCommerce blah, blah, blah is a major update. And I mean, it was in red and like <laughs> highlighted in yellow. And I took a screenshot of that comment and a screenshot of the thing and put it on Twitter. And that is the one time I had a snarky response. And I felt bad about it later, but I was also like, come on. <laughs> Right. Come yeah. on, we did yeah, warn absolutely. you. <laughs> yep, that's that's exactly yes. Like, right. I feel horrible that your site. I feel horrible that your site broke, and I'm I'm right. very sorry about that. But like, don't see what didn't warn you was right there. Yeah, it was we, red. <laughs> we tried everything we could. And, we tried. Yep. So, uh, it does it does feel cathartic for like a minute. It's a lot like Chinese food, right? Like it feels really good, and then <laughs> later you're like, why did I do that? I feel terrible. Oh yeah. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Awesome. Uh, that's going to be the tagline for this. Snarky comments are like Chinese food. <laughs> I love it. Awesome. N Nicole, thanks so much for your time today. I had a really great time and I learned a lot. If people want to learn more, where can they find you? So right now I am occasionally blogging on jetpack.com slash blog. Um, you can keep up with my adventures and my WordCamp talks at NicoleCKohler.com or follow me on Twitter at, at NicoleCKohler. All right. Easy enough. I will link all of those in the show notes, too. Uh, thanks again so much for joining me. I really appreciate your time. Yeah, thanks, Joe. I had a great time. Thanks again to Nicole for joining me. I know after this interview, I started to put my own strategy in place. And hopefully this has inspired you to do so as well. And speaking of inspiring, thanks to our sponsors. Make sure to check out Liquid Web for managed WordPress hosting. I use them for all of my important sites. They are that good. They're over at buildpodcast.net slash liquid, and they'll give you 50% off your first two months just for being a listener. If you want to save clients or yourself money through recovering abandoned carts, check out Jilt. They're over at buildpodcast.net slash Jilt. And finally, if you want conference calls to be crystal clear, and as easy as possible. Check out Vast Conference. You can get a 30-day free trial just by mentioning how I built it when you speak to a sales representative over at buildpodcast.net slash vast. For all of the show notes, head over to howibuilt.it slash 71. If you like the show, head over to Apple Podcasts and leave us a rating and a review. It really helps people discover us. I recently published my brand new Patreon page. It offers a lot of great rewards, fantastic goals, and I'm really doubling down on it. So if you like the show and want to support it individually, head over to patreon.com slash how I built it. You can support the show for as little as a dollar a month. Next week, we're going to talk to Jen Jamar about market strategy for your business. This is another great conversation that I couldn't enjoy more. Jen's ex excellent experience gives her a lot of insight that she passes on to us. So make sure to tune in. And until next week, get out there and build something.